Hello, it's Rudin and Lagarde. Today we're going to be solving October, November 2021, variant 2, paper 1. If you find this channel useful, please subscribe and like this video. Question number 1. A scale bar on an electron micrograph is 2 cm long. So 2 cm here is the image size and represents an actual length of 1 micrometer. What is the magnification of the electron micrograph? First of all, the equation for magnification is image size divided by actual size. So what do we do is first of all, we have to convert the two centimeter into micrometers by first multiplying by 10 to convert to millimeters, then multiplying by a thousand to convert to micrometers. It's going to give us 25,000. And this is the image size. So 25,000 micrometers divided by one micrometer would give us 20,000 magnification. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Question number two, the eyepiece of a microscope is fitted with an eyepiece graticule and a stage micrometer scale is placed on the microscope. Which statements about the stage micrometer scale are correct? Number one, the scale can be used to measure the actual length of cells directly. This is incorrect because for those who don't know, a stage micrometer is basically just a ruler with a specific calibration or a length. And first of all, before you actually use it to measure size, an eyepiece graticule has to be calibrated first with the stage micrometer. So you can't use it directly to measure the actual length. So this is incorrect. Point number two, the scale allows you to calibrate the IP's graticule. As you mentioned earlier, this is definitely correct. Once it's calibrated at the specific magnification, then definitely you can figure out the actual size. Three, less of the scale is visible as the objective lens changes from 10 magnification to 40. This is totally correct because as you zoom at, uh, as you zoom in, obviously less of the scale is going to be visible compared when you zoom out the full scale might be visible. Therefore, this is correct. The answer is going to be B. Question number three. Four students were asked to match the function within the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The functions were listed by number. Which student correctly matched the numbered function with the appearance of the cell structure? To start with point number one, mRNA passes through to the ribosome. We annotated here, it must definitely be the nuclear envelope. Why, you would ask? When mRNA is synthesized during transcription, it has to pass out of the nucleus through the nuclear pores in the nuclear envelope in order to go to the ribosome to get, uh, to get translated. Therefore, it's going to be a nuclear envelope. Let's see the suggestions we have here. It's either V or X. Let's look at V. Membranes which surround and enclose inner cavity. This is definitely incorrect because this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it's continuous with the nuclear envelope. So this is incorrect. For X, a double membrane interspersed with pores. A double membrane interspersed with pores definitely represents the nuclear envelope because nuclear envelope has pores. In this case, X is going to be correct Point number two, organizes microtubules to produce the spindle during cell division. As we annotated here, it's definitely going to be the centrioles, and centrioles are made of microtubules. So let's see the suggestions. It's either W or Y. Non-membrane bound spherical structures is going to be incorrect because microtubules are not spherical. Spherical here, it represents the ribosomes. So W is incorrect. For why non-membrane bound cylindrical structures? This is correct because and here you could definitely see the structure of a micro microtubule you could see is cylindrical. So why is going to be correct? For point number three, synthesis of polypeptides, we all know it's definitely going to be the ribosomes. So let's see the suggestions. It's either Z or W. Z membrane bound sacs arranged as flattened sac stack. This is definitely going to be the Golgi body, so this is incorrect. So the answer is going to be D. Question number four. Which cell structures are required for the formation of lysosomes and the hydrolytic enzymes that they contain? First of all, we all know that hydrolytic enzymes are definitely proteins and proteins are modified and packaged inside the Golgi body. So definitely Golgi body is a correct answer. And we all know in order to synthesize this polypeptide chain, 
and carry out transcription and translation, we need a high proportion of ATP. Therefore, we need a high proportion of mitochondria which produces this ATP. So definitely mitochondria is correct. The last point here, we have rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is definitely correct because the rough endoplasmic reticulum contains the ribosome where polypeptide is synthesized. So this is definitely correct. Four is going to be B. Five, which cell structures contain ribosomal RNA? So the cell structures which contain ribosomal RNA are definitely going to be ribosomes because ribosomes are made from ribosomal RNA plus ribosomal proteins. So let's see the structures which might contain ribosomes. Perchloroplast definitely does contain 70S ribosomes because it does carry out protein synthesis. So this is correct. For mitochondria, it also contains 70S ribosomes. This is correct. For 3, nucleus, it contains 80S ribosomes. So this is correct. For smooth endoplasmic reticulum, it does not contain any ribosomes. The correct answer is going to be B. For 6, the single-celled organism measures 700 micrometers in diameter and is enclosed in a cell wall. The genetic material of it is located free in the cytoplasm, which it occurs as thousands of copies of circular DNA. Most of the cell is taken up by a large fagule, which stores essential chemicals for metabolism. So let's just break this apart. Here, don't be fooled by the cell size, it's 700 micrometers. Actually, here it does mention that the genetic material is located free in the cytoplasm and it's circular. These only features could happen with a prokaryotic cell no matter how large its size. So it's definitely a prokaryote because its DNA is circular and is located in the cytoplasm. So the correct answer is going to be D. Question number seven, a student carried out four tests on a sample of biological molecules. Which conclusions made by the student are correct? Point number one, fat was present. The emulsion test is always positive with fats if it turns cloudy. So this is correct, fats are present. Point number two, glucose was present. Here, they carried out a test on Benedict's regent, and here it observes if any reducing sugars are present. If the solution turns from blue to yellow, then definitely reducing sugars are present. But here, it says specifically glucose. We cannot really assume that because there are other reducing sugars such as maltose and fructose. And it could be any one of those. Therefore, this is incorrect. For three, protein was present. The Biuret test is the test for, that tests for the presence of proteins, and it turns from blue to purple, so this is a positive test, this is correct. For starch was not present. If starch is present for the iodine test, the, the solution turns from yellow to blue-black color. If it stayed yellow, it means starch is not present, so this is correct. The answer is going to be four. Which general formula is correct for monosaccharides such as fructose? As we all know, let's just forget about sucrose for the moment. We all know that glucose is C6H12O6. The empirical formula is going to be CH2O. So the correct answer is going to be B. Question number 9. Which statements can be used to describe the structure of cellulose? Number one, a polymer of glucose monomers linked by beta 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds. This is totally correct because cellulose is made of beta glucose rotated 180 degrees to each other. Point number two, a polysaccharide of hexose monomers. Hexose is correct because beta glucose is definitely a hexose sugar. Number three, an unbranched macromolecule made of beta-glucose monomers. It's definitely a macromolecule because it's made of many monomers. Macromolecule basically means a large molecule. So this is correct. The answer is going to be A. Question number 10. Complete hydrolysis of polysaccharides requires all the glycosidic bonds between the monomers to be broken. Enzyme X only breaks... 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds, which shows how completely an enzyme X can hydrolyze molecules of glycogen and amylose. 
So let's just break down the question. We all know that glycogen is highly branched. Therefore, it contains a high proportion of one to six glycosidic bonds. And for amylose, it's unbranched and contains only one to four glycosidic bonds. And for glycogen, it contains a high proportion of one to six glycosidic bonds followed with also one to four glycosidic bonds. So it contains both and for amylose, it only contains one. And let's see the suggestions that we have here. So surely, amylose is going to have a higher digestion. So the appropriate answer is definitely going to be A. 11. Which molecules contain at least two double bonds? We all know that proteins definitely do have double bonds, or amino acids do have double bonds because it contains a carboxylic acid group with a double bond. So here we are looking for proteins. For a saturated fatty acid is incorrect. Collagen is a protein, so it's correct. Hemoglobin is also correct. For B, collagen and saturated fatty acid only, this is incorrect. Hemoglobin and collagen only, this is correct because both of them are proteins. So the answer is going to be C. 12. The diagram shows an amino acid. Which group is changed to produce different amino acids? So the group that always changes is going to be the R group or the side chain. And don't get confused with that hydrogen because that hydrogen always stays there and it's not altered. In this case, the R group is definitely going to be CH3 and the amine group is NH2 and the carboxylic acid group is definitely going to be this one. So the only choice here we have is going to be C. Question number 13, which row is correct about the structure of proteins? Let's first start with the primary structure. A, determined by the sequence of DNA nucleotides. This is correct. The number of amino acids in each polypeptide chain, this is also correct. Because basically the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. Coming back to point number C, formed by 20 different amino acids linked in a specific order. It doesn't necessarily have to be 20, but we could say it's right for now. D, the sequence of amino acids in each polypeptide chain, the sequence, this is definitely correct, for secondary. Secondary structure is basically the hydrogen bonding between the, the H in the amine group and the O in the carboxyl group and it has nothing to do with side chains peptide bond itself now let's see the suggestions occurs by hydrogen bonding between nh and co groups of amino acids this is definitely correct in a single polypeptide it is either an alpha helix or b pleated sheet this is incorrect because it actually could be both Coming back to point C, an alpha helix is formed by hydrogen bonds between side chains of amino acids. This is definitely incorrect. Side chains is incorrect because as we have mentioned earlier, these bonds are formed between atoms in the peptide bond. For D, a B pleated sheet is the result of a folded polypeptide forming hydrogen bonds between adjacent strands. This is definitely correct. Tertiary. Disulfide ionic hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions are all involved. This is correct. They are involved between the R groups or the side chains of amino acids. And these bonds are all there and this is correct. B. The bonds are formed at specific points determined by the primary structure. This is correct and don't get confused because primary structure contains the amino acids which contains the R groups. So it will definitely determine the tertiary bonding. For C, only globular proteins have this level of structure. This is correct because examples of globular proteins are enzymes. D, reactions between side chains of specific amino acids give a specific 3D shape. Yes, this is correct because side chains is correct and specific amino acids is also correct. For the quaternary, always formed by association of two or more polypeptides. Two or more, this is definitely correct. 
and the same type of bonding in the tertiary occurs between those different polypeptide chains. In tertiary, the bonding occurs within the single polypeptide chain and in quaternary, it occurs between the different polypeptide chains. So this is definitely correct. The answer is going to be Question number 14. Which graph correctly shows possible changes in energy levels as a chemical reaction progressed with or without the enzyme? So as I've written here, enzymes lower the activation energy of the reaction taking place by providing an alternative pathway. And this right here represents the activation energy. So definitely with the enzyme, it's going to be a much lower line because it's a lower activation energy. Both of them must end up on the same line. So the only suggestion that might be correct is definitely C, because this is incorrect, they cannot end on separate energy levels. Question number 15. The graph shows the relationship between the concentration of substrate and the rate of enzyme-catalyzed reaction. Which row shows how Km and Vmax for this enzyme would be affected if the same reaction was carried out in the presence of a competitive inhibitor? So what does a competitive inhibitor do to start with? First of all, it binds or competes with the substrate for active sites, for the active site. So what happens, it's, it's very normal for the affinity of the substrate to the enzyme to definitely decrease because now there is a competition. So there's a rule that you have to know. As affinity decreases, Km increases. Why? Because they are inversely proportional. And for those who don't know, is that Km is a substrate concentration at half Vmax. And it's a measure of affinity, as we said, as Km increases, the affinity decreases. And for those who don't know what Vmax is, Vmax is basically the rate of the reaction. So as we just said, the Km increases and Vmax remains the same. Okay, you would ask definitely why the Vmax remains the same. In a competitive inhibitor, if you increase the substrate concentration, then the effect of the competitive inhibitor decreases. Therefore, the rate is able to also increase to reach the normal Vmax value. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Question number 16. Liver cells contain vesicles that have proteins in their membranes which are specific for the transport of glucose. So membrane proteins are visible. When these cells need to take up glucose, the vesicles fuse with the cell surface membrane. How does the uptake of glucose occur? First of all, this was a very common misconception for candidates. Let's just split it up into small pieces. First of all, here it says, it mentions membrane proteins. Membrane proteins are always involved either in active transport or facilitated diffusion. Therefore, the, the, the answer is definitely going to be D. Many candidates chose this as exocytosis, but since it mentions membrane proteins, this, then facilitated diffusion is going to be a better option. 17. A student set up an experiment to investigate diffusion. A block of agar was stained uniformly with a water-soluble blue dye. The block of agar was put into a test tube containing 10 cm cubed of distilled water at 20 degrees. The intensity of the blue color of the water after 5 minutes were measured. Four other experiments were then carried out using different numbers of agar blocks, different sizes of agar blocks, and different temperatures. All other variables were standardized. Which experiment would give a lighter blue color? Let's just highlight this part. A lighter blue color in the water five minutes compared to the first experiment. Okay, to start with, here it's mentioning a lighter blue color in the water. We all know that the stain diffuses from the cube into the water, meaning 
that if there is less stain and the rate of diffusion is less so as diffusion is less then the color is going to be lighter because if diffusion increases then the color of the water is going to be darker so here we're looking for the factors that give us the least rate of diffusion first of all let's start with the temperature it's definitely going to be 20 degrees because as temperature decreases the particles have less kinetic energy and move slower and let's see the size of each agar block here we have this and this the first choice gives us a much higher surface area to volume ratio so the answer is going to be b 18 which description is correct a a centromere holds two chromatids together until the end of prophase and attaches to the microtubules of the spindle first of all this is completely incorrect because it actually holds the two chromatids up until the end of my of metaphase because in metaphase the chromosomes arrange at the metaphase equator still as two chromatids so therefore this is totally incorrect for b a chromatid is one of the two identical parts of a chromosome and is made of proteins and two molecules of dna first of all a chromatid is made of a single molecule of dna a chromosome is made of two molecules of DNA. So this is incorrect. For C, a chromosome is a structure with two identical parts made of DNA and proteins found in the nucleus of a prokaryotic cell. First of all, this is incorrect. We all know that prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus and they, they don't have a linear DNA like the one we do have. So this is definitely incorrect. D. A telomere is a sequence of DNA nucleotides repeated many times and found at the ends of each chromatid. This is correct. The function of telomeres is to prevent the loss of genes as the cell divides. So the answer is going to be D. 19. During metaphase, a scientist stains the chromosomes of a diploid animal cell with a fluorescent dye to allow the telomeres to be observed. This cell has 26 chromosomes. How many telomeres will the scientist observe? First of all, let's start out by drawing the chromosome. As we all know, chromosomes are made of two chromatids. And each chromatid has two telomeres at each end. Each chromatid has two telomeres. So, a single chromosome with two chromatids would definitely have four telomeres. Here it's telling us that we have 26 chromosomes. If you multiply 26 by 4, the answer is going to be 104 and the answer is going to be D. Question number 20. The photomicrographs show cells in various stages of the cell cycle. Which cells contain twice as many DNA molecules as a cell from the same organism that has just finished a complete mitotic cell cycle ending with cytokinesis? This is obvious. Here, this is metaphase, this is anaphase, this is prophase, and this is anaphase. Actually, this is late anaphase and early telophase. As is visible here, these are all in mitosis. And as it is visible here, before mitosis, S phase takes place. Here's the S phase. And in S phase, DNA replication takes place. So the number of genes are multiplied by two until it reaches cytokinesis, which it halves again. Therefore, anything in mitosis, PMAT, is going to have double the number of DNA. Therefore, A is going to be correct uncontrolled cell division can result in the formation of a tumor which part of the cell cycle would take less time during the formation of a tumor it's a general rule of thumb and it's definitely going to be interface number 22 a piece of dna molecule contains 84 base pairs the table shows the number of 89 and cytosine bases in one or both of the dna strands in this piece of dna molecule 
how many guanine bases are present in this piece of DNA molecule. So let's just break down the question. Here it says 84 base pairs. So each strand contains 84 bases. Let's just draw out the DNA molecule. And let's start with the easier part. We all know that in strand number one, we have cytosine and it's 15. We know that cytosine would definitely pair up with guanine on strand two via complementary base pairing. Therefore, if in the strand one, there are 15 base pairs of cytosine, there's always go going to be also 15 bases of guanine on the other strand. So we know that for guanine in strand two, we have 15 bases. In strand 2, that there are 23 adenine bases. Therefore, adenine on strand number 2 also pairs up with thymine on strand number 1 via complementary base pairing. Strand number 2 has 23 bases, then definitely strand number 1 is going to also have 23 bases of thymine. And here it says there are 84 base pairs. Therefore, if we add all of them up, if we add 28 plus 15 plus 23 is going to give us 66. And if we subtract 84 minus 66, it's definitely going to give us 18. So in strand one, we have 18 guanine. And on strand two, we have 15. If we, and here it's asking how many guanine bases are present in this piece of DNA molecule, so the full DNA molecule. How you do this is you add 18 plus 15, it gives you 33 and the answer is going to be B. Question number 23. The mRNA sequence of the three stop codons are shown. Which mutation in the template transcribed strand of the DNA sequence that codes for the polypeptide would cause translation to stop prematurely? Here you can see that UAA changed to UAG. In the first place, it was anyways a stop codon, so it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So this is incorrect. So stop codon change into a stop codon. Won't really terminate translation. For B, UGA is converted to UGU. UGU is not a stop codon, so this is incorrect. UGG is changed to UAA. This is correct, and UAG is changed to AUC, so this is also incorrect. And this is a stop codon, by the way, so the answer is going to be C. Number 24, which features of a companion cells are essential to their function? They are connected to the sift tube elements by plasmodesmata. This is obviously very important for its function, because sucrose moves to the sift tube elements, by the plasmodesmata in the companion cells by diffusion. So they must be present for sucrose transportation. So this is correct. Point number two, they have a thicker cell wall than a sift tube element. Actually, this is not an advantage because if companion cells have a thicker cell wall, this means that diffusion into the sift tube element is going to take a longer time. So this is not an advantage. Therefore, this is incorrect. Three, they contain a nucleus and mitochondria. Definitely correct. So the answer is going to be B. Number 25. Which statements about water movement in plants are correct? Point number one, water can pass through cellulose cell walls. This is correct because cellulose is freely permeable. Two, water cannot pass through lignified cell walls. This is correct because lignin is actually impermeable to water. 3. Water can pass through cell walls that contain suburin. This is totally incorrect because suburin is also a waterproof material. So the only correct answer is going to be B. Question number 26. The diameter of a tree trunk usually decreases slightly during the day. Which changes in the environmental factors during the day could cause the diameter to decrease even more? So let's just explain the part of decreasing. We all know as transpiration increases, the diameter decreases 
much more so they are inversely proportional. Why this happens you might ask as transpiration increases, the tension in the xylem vessel elements increases. Why we, you would ask is because of cohesion between water molecules pulling them up and pulling the xylem vessel walls to the center causing a decrease in diameter. So here what are we looking for is we're looking for the factors that actually increase transpiration. In this case, increased humidity actually decreases transpiration because it lowers the water potential gradient, so this is incorrect. Increases with speed. This is correct because increasing wind speed increases the rate of transpiration because it increases the water potential gradient. Next point is increased temperature. This is definitely correct because increased temperature means particles have more kinetic energy and evaporate much faster. So the answer is going to be B. 27. Which sequence of events could lead to mass flow in a flown sieve tube? So the first order and what happens is number 5. Because protons are actively pumped out of companion cells. First of all, H plus ions are pumped out of companion cells by proton pumps. into the companion cell wall. Then the next step is going to be number two. Protons and sucrose molecules move into a companion cell through a cold transporter protein. When a high proportion of H plus ions are out, and also sucrose molecules are going to be outside the companion cell. Both of them go back inside the companion cell through something called a cold transporter protein hydrogen by facilitated diffusion, down concentration gradient, and sucrose goes back or goes in the companion cell against concentration gradients. So this is definitely the second point. The third point we have here is definitely going to be one because sucrose moves into a sieve tube element. Once a high proportion of sucrose is inside the companion cell, it moves into the sieve tube elements through the plasmodesmata. So through plasmodesmata by diffusion The next point is going to be 4. The water potential of the sieve tube element decreases. Why you would ask? Because the sucrose concentration is increasing within this part of the sieve tube element. Then, 6 is the next one because water moves down a water potential gradient by osmosis. Why? It's because here there is a high proportion of sucrose. Then it's very normal for water from surrounding cells to move into the sieve tube element by osmosis down water potential gradient. The next point is going to be 3 a very high hydrostatic pressure is produced. Once so much water moves into this part of the sieve tube elements, there is a high hydrostatic pressure and at the, at the source. And at the sink, there is a lower hydrostatic pressure. Therefore here, a hydrostatic pressure gradient is produced and sucrose moves down that hydrostatic pressure gradient into the sink. So definitely D is going to be correct. So what will happen as a result of the blood pressure in the right ventricle becoming higher than the blood pressure in the right atrium? This basically means that the pressure decreases in the right atrium. If the pressure decreases in the right atrium, let's just draw then that's, that atrioventricular valve cannot actually open. The first point is the semilunar valve in the aorta will close. First of all, the right ventricle has nothing to do with the aorta because the right ventricle actually leads off the, to the pulmonary artery. So this is the incorrect. Coming to point B, the semilunar valve in the pulmonary artery will close. 
Okay, first of all, pul pulmonary artery part is right because it's in the right side of the heart. But the semilunar valve in the pulmonary artery will close is definitely incorrect. Why, you would ask? Because here it says the blood pressure in the right ventricle is actually higher. This means that it pushes that semilunar valve open even more. So it definitely won't close. See, the left atrioventricular valve will close. This is incorrect because here it says the left. And here we're talking about the right side. So the only uh, right answer is going to be D, as we mentioned here, because the atrium cannot generate an enough pressure to actually open the atrioventricular valve so it closes. So this is correct. Question number 29. The graph shows the pressure changes in different parts of the heart during a mammalian cardiac cycle. Which row correctly identifies W, X, Y, and Z? So to start with, I've written here a few notes. And I'll give you a trick. And it's C, O, C, O. For close open, close open. And as I have I written here, pressure changes in the ventricle represents opening and closing of atrioventricular valve. And here, this is the line for the ventricle. And as we said here, close. So definitely, the atrioventricular valve closes. So this is correct, and all the rest are incorrect. If you want to know the root behind this, is because here it's ventricular systole because the pressure increases systole by meaning it's where the ventricle actually contracts so if the ventricle contracts the semilunar valve opens and the atrioventricular valve closes to stop backflow of blood back into the atrium so this is that's why it's correct for X, as we can see here, we labeled it with open. What is open here is definitely the semilunar valve because as we have mentioned, this is ventricular systole and the large pressure in the ventricle pushes the semilunar valve open. So X is correct and it's going to be semilunar valve opens. For Y, definitely going to be closed. Why the semilunar valve closes is because the pressure in the ventricle starts to decrease. If the pressure in the ventricle starts to decrease, so it can no longer push through the semilunar valve, so it closes. So why is semilunar valve closes? And for Z here, we could see that atrial systole is starting to take place. Atrial systole is when the atrium contracts. If the atrium contracts, then it generates a high pressure to push the atrial ventricular valve open therefore the atrioventricular valve opens and b is the correct answer for c which statements are correct number one compared with blood tissue fluid has less protein and no red blood cells this is totally correct tissue fluid does not have red blood cells because they are too large to pass through the pores of the capillaries this protein is because the large plasma proteins are also unable to pass through the capillary pores and only the smaller ones pass through that's why there's less protein so this is definitely correct two lymph may contain lipids carbon dioxide and phagocytes this is correct it does contain lipids and all this carbon dioxide is a waste material from the metabolism of cells for three Tissue fluid contains glucose, amino acids, urea, and carbon dioxide. Urea and carbon dioxide are waste materials, and glucose are, and amino acids are nutrients. So this is correct. The answer is A. 31. Which statements about the formation of a hemoglobinic acid are correct? To start with, hemoglobinic acid is when hydrogen ions combine with hemoglobin. When this happens, the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen decreases and it releases, the hemoglobin releases oxygen. Let's see the choices we have here. It can only occur with the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin. This is correct because as we said, the affinity for hemoglobin to oxygen decreases. This is correct. Two, it removes excess hydrogen ions, preventing blood from becoming too acidic. This is correct because when hydrogen ions bind 
to hemoglobin, its proportion decreases in the plasma itself. So this is correct. Three, it is linked to the action of carbonic anhydrase. This is totally correct because why in the first place does the hydrogen ions concentration increase, you would ask. It's because when carbon dioxide combines with water in the red blood cell, it is converted to carbonic acid by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. This whole reaction is catalyzed by carbonic anhydrase. This carbonic acid dissociates into H plus ions and bicarbonate ions. So it's directly linked to the action of carbonic anhydrase. So all three are correct. The answer is going to be A. Question number 32. What explains how the maximum volume of oxygen Maximum volume of oxygen is taken up as blood passes through the capillaries of the lungs. So, A. Each hemoglobin molecule can temporarily bind to four oxygen atoms. Atoms is actually incorrect. It's supposed to be four oxygen molecules or eight oxygen atoms. Fergie, this is the dissociation of carbon dioxide from carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin is when carbon monoxide combines with hemoglobin, so this is incorrect. If carbon dioxide combines with hemoglobin, it forms carbaminohemoglobin, not carboxyhemoglobin, so this is incorrect. For C, the binding of the first oxygen molecule to hemoglobin decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for binding other oxygen molecules. This is definitely incorrect because when the first oxygen molecule binds to hemoglobin, it has an allosteric effect. By means, it makes it easier for the next oxygen molecule and the next oxygen molecule to bind to hemoglobin. So it actually increases the affinity, not decreases. So this is incorrect. D. Oxyhemoglobin formation increases the ability of red blood cells to transport oxygen. This is correct because oxyhemoglobin is formed when oxygen binds with hemoglobin. So the correct answer is going to be D. Three. The image shown is a photomicrograph of a transverse section of part of the gas exchange system. And this definitely looks as a trachea. What describes the image? To start with, a thin inner layer of ciliated epithelial cells on the top of a layer containing cartilage supported by elastic fibers. To break it down, it assumes that ciliated epithelial cells and it's this layer is on top of a layer containing cartilage. Apparently, this is incorrect because this is not cartilage. This is actually smooth muscle. And this is cartilage. So this is incorrect. B. A very thin epithelial lining with walls containing elastic fibers, surrounded by many blood vessels. This is incorrect because it does not mention the, the cartilage, it does not mention the smooth muscle. This is correct. And it's not a very thin epithelial lining. This is incorrect. C. An inner layer of ciliated epithelial and goblet cells. This is correct, on top of elastic fibers supported by an outer layer consisting of, of cartilage. Definitely incorrect because here it mentions that there is an outer layer of cartilage and top of elastic fibers. Yes, there are some elastic fibers. And an inner layer, this is an inner layer of ciliated epithelial and goblet cells. So this seems to be the correct answer. 34. Which row shows the tissues that are present in the wall of the trachea and the wall of the bronchus? Let's start with smooth muscle. Yes, definitely both the trachea and bronchus do have smooth muscle. The second point is the squamous epithelium. This is definitely incorrect because the only structure in the lung that has squamous epithelium is going to be the alveoli. So this is definitely incorrect. The next point here is we have goblet cells. Definitely this is correct because both of them have ciliated epithelial cells, so this is correct. The answer is going to be C. 35. When a person suffers an asthma attack, the tubes of the gas exchange system narrow and extra mucus is produced. Which changes occur during an asthma attack? So let's break it down. Here it says that the tubes narrow. 
Narrow means the smooth muscles. Contracts. And extra mucus is produced means that goblet cells release more mucus. So the choices that we have here. One, activity of ciliated epithelium increases. This is correct because ciliated epithelium has goblet cells and has cilia which helps sweep that mucus. This is correct. Two, endocytosis in goblet cells increases. Actually, this is incorrect. It's exocytosis. So this is incorrect. For three, smooth muscles are more active. More active by means contracts more. So this is correct. The answer is going to be C. 36. Which flow diagram correctly describes the effect of TOR entering the lungs? First of all, TOR is a carcinogen. What carcinogens do is they cause mutations. What mutation does is a sudden change of base sequence of DNA and cancerous cells forms. For 36, the only description that suits this is going to be A. Because carcinogens come into contact with DNA, mutation occurs, this is correct, then uncontrolled cell division occurs. 7. Which control measures would reduce the transmission of tuberculosis? So first of all, there are two species of tuberculosis. The first one is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. and Mycobacterium bovis. For to Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the method of transmission is definitely airborne droplets, aka someone coughing in the air, contaminated surfaces. For Mycobacterium bovis, it's always going to be unpasteurized, caused by someone drinking unpasteurized milk or eating raw meat so we made a few points here clear let's see the choices boiling water before drinking it actually this is incorrect because the pathogen that's transmitted by fecal oral route is cholera this would help in case of cholera but not tuberculosis so this is incorrect two antibiotics yes definitely vaccination Yes, it would definitely help because vaccination means that the body has memory cells for the tuberculosis. If it re-enters the cell, if it re-enters the body, the person does not get sick. 28. Comorbidity is where an individual has two or more diseases or medical conditions at the same time. Some medical conditions are particularly likely to result in comorbidity. In one example, initial infection with one pathogen can increase the risk of developing a second disease by the factor of 15 or more. The second disease is then the major cause of death for these people. In basic words, here it's talking about opportunistic infections. We've definitely seen this in the syllabus with HIV. What HIV does is it infects T cells suppressing the immune system. So what happens even if a pathogen is dormant? It can actually cause disease and major death because the immune system is suppressed and it cannot actually fight that second pathogen that entered the body. The only correct answer is going to be C because HIV infection followed by the development of a tuberculosis. Question number 29. Which conditions are infectious and result in high white blood cell count? Here it's mentioning leukemia. Actually, it does result in high white blood cell count because the stem cells divide uncontrollably, but it is not infectious, so this is incorrect. For two, myasthenia gravis. First of all, this is not infectious, so this is incorrect. And then we have tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is infectious and results in high white blood cell count because a clonal selection, then clonal expansion happens. So the only correct answer that could be is definitely D. Question number 40. Which cell type causes a secondary immune response to be much faster than the primary immune response? 
Secondary immune response occurs when the pathogen re-enters body for the second time. In this case, because memory cells are formed previously, memory cells divide into plasma cells and more memory cells. And these plasma cells release antibodies. And all this happens at a faster rate and with high higher proportion of antibodies than the primary immune response. So coming back to our question, which cell type causes the secondary immune response to be much faster than the primary immune response? It's definitely memory cells. Because in the primary immune response, there are no memory cells produced yet. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you find it useful, please share and subscribe and like this video. Thank you very much.